Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt coming to you from the Wichita Mountains in Oklahoma. Today is Friday, December 2nd, 2022. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First, let me start by saying, guys, please forgive me. Uh, my schedule is so crazy these days that it's really hard for me to be able to put two or three hours together to make a message. Um, this is the most important work that I do, though, right here. Uh, I, I, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only a privilege, but it's a commandment. It's something we're supposed to do, so forgive me if I fall short of that. Um, but let's have a look at a few things going on. Have you seen what the UN is doing? Out of World Israel News, shameful disgrace, the UN declares Israel's establishment a catastrophe. You know, the Bible tells us that the whole world comes against Israel. We're watching it happen. The UN represents the entire world, what, some 203 countries or something like that, 192 of them. Um, and they have more resolutions against Israel than all other countries combined. They hate Israel. It's sad. The Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, verse 6. God says that Israel is the apple of his eye. God loves the gates of Zion. Israel is God's land that he gave to his people. The Jews are God's chosen people because God chose the Jewish race to bring us the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's why they're chosen. Jesus returns to Israel. His feet will touch at the Mount of Olives, where he delivered Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. I've stood on the Mount of Olives, wondering how close I was to the location where Christ will return to earth when he comes back. He's coming, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. God's truth doesn't depend upon your acceptance of it. It's true no matter how you feel about it. But the UN is only perpetuating this conflict between Israel and the so-called Palestinians. I say so-called because there are no Palestinians. They're a made-up group of people whose only reason to exist is to try to destroy Israel. There's nobody that claims to be a Palestinian who was born in a place called Palestine. Most of them were born in Egypt, Syria, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Lebanon. But the UN General Assembly voted to formally recognize Nakba Day. Nakba. This means catastrophe in Arabic. Catastrophe. Let me just remind you that the Jews were in Israel more than 2,000 years before Islam ever became a thing. Islam came about late in the 6th century after Jesus' death. So the Jews had already been there for a couple of thousand years already. And yet the world wants to say that Israel stole this other group of people's land when Israel was there 2,000 years before they were. Go figure. Amazing. Are you watching Iran? Iran doing all kinds of strange things these days. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Iran intensifying efforts to kidnap, kill officials, activists, and journalists. These covert actions, even in the West, killing officials. Strange. Very strange. You know, Iran is mentioned in Scripture. Persia, Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. They lead a world army against Israel. Wonder why that is. I think I know. Um... Israel will have to strike Iran's nuclear facilities in order to ensure their existence. Iran will gather the pity of the world, the sympathy of the world, as the world says, oh, Israel shouldn't have done that to you, go get them. We'll give you the green light. Some weak-minded, godless leader like Joe Biden would probably be like, yeah, go get them. Wait, where am I? When I was a kid, I heard my my dad and I used to listen to Paul Harvey 
my dad had a feed grinding business and we'd go grind feed for all these various ranchers and farmers. And always at 12 noon, we would stop, have our lunch and listen to Paul Harvey. And I remember he had this commentary one day, uh, something along the lines, if I were the devil. And he went through this story telling what he would do if he were the devil in order to destroy the world. And it's if you get a chance to listen to it, Google it and see, listen to it. Uh, because many of the things that he had said way back then in the 60s are things that are happening now. Um, you know, the devil is our enemy and he does want to destroy us. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He roams about like a ravenous lion seeking whom he may just devour, the Bible tells us. He is our enemy. Sadly, there's so many people who think he doesn't even exist. They give him no power, or other people give him too much power, thinking he's all-powerful and can do anything. He does want to destroy America. He does want to destroy families. I think he's... Realizing his time is short. You know, the devil knows scripture better than anybody. Of course, he's had a few thousand years to read it. Um, I just wonder if he thinks he can somehow change it. If he thinks, oh, well, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to be thrown into this pit for a thousand years. Not going to happen. You know, when you read in Job... And you, you read that God and the devil are having conversations. You have to wonder, at some point, did, did God ever be like, well, you don't have to worry about that. I'm casting you out in that time period. You have to wonder what other conversations they've had. Um, devil's trying his best to break down families right now. Uh, all these woke organizations out there fighting under these banners of feminist rights and all these other anti-family positions. There is a war being waged on the nuclear family. Divorce rates are climbing, even among Christians. More and more people quitting on their marriages. I think the devil knows that people are stronger together than apart, so he's trying everything he can to break down the nuclear family. Jesus told us in Matthew 19, when he was uh, speaking about what was written in Malachi 2.16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence. The devil hates the family. If the family goes, so goes society. Uh, divorce causes a lot of pain, has all kinds of negative effects on children of broken homes. So if the devil can... Break families apart. They come. They become more vulnerable to temptation, trying to destroy a nation. What about abortion? You know, if you can't break the family apart, maybe eliminate it before it ever begins. Americans have ab aborted over 63 million babies since 1983. 63 million. You think that's something? China has aborted over 300 million in that same time period. It's a lot of babies. Who do you suppose those babies were sacrificed to? You know, let's make one thing absolutely clear. God hates abortion. I mean, let's call abortion what it truly is. It's murder. You're stopping a beating heart. That in itself is the definition of murder. God's word says you shall not kill. Yet abortion somehow given the green light to kill. Trying to normalize murder through abortion. I'm sorry, that body inside your body is not your body. Abortion is murder. No matter what you want to say about it, no matter how you want to spin it, no matter how you want to justify it, abortion is murder. And people who have done it will stand before the Almighty Judge. Just saying. We see all this confusion over sexual identity. It just baffles the mind. I, I've read where some people say there's some 700 genders, and I'm just like, are you stupid? Really? God created them male and female, he says. If you're confused about your gender, look in your underwear. The answer's right there. 
It's pretty simple. There's two genders. The Bible doesn't say, God created the male, female, fluid, and otherwise. No, there's male and female. Again, God and his truth doesn't depend upon your opinion of it. Male and female, period. Don't like it? Take it up with God. He's the one that created them male and female. Um... Mm. We're seeing all this LGBTQ stuff. I, I'm, I'm seeing where Disney has these LGBTQ characters. Uh, Same-sex couples seems to be shoved down our throats everywhere we turn. It's, it's sickening. I'm sorry. Um, male and female. It's also the way God defines marriage. A man and a woman. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I'm not a homophobe. I'm not a Islamophobe. I, I'm not any of these phobes because a phobia is a fear. I'm not afraid of any of this. I just stick to God's word. This is truth. Man's lies, man's opinions, man's twisted perversions are not truth. God's word is truth, and I'm sticking with that. Okay? I'm a God-fearing Christ follower, okay? If you want to put me in a box, put me in that box. God-fearing, Bible-believing, Christ follower. That's me. <clears throat> I go by what he says. We see all these emotional disorders, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem from kids, all these children on these crazy medications. It's just bizarre. Jesus tells us in John 10.10, 10, the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. <sighs> Too many people don't trust in him. You know, Jesus told us he didn't come to bring peace but division. And the division Jesus brings is you either believe he is who he said he is or you don't. Well, the devil has always imitated God. Always. In fact, it's pretty well known that the, the ministry of Jesus was about three and a half years long. From the time of his baptism till the time he died on the cross, about three and a half years. The devil's going to imitate that even. During the Great Tribulation, this Antichrist will be in charge of the earth for three and a half years. The devil's always tried to imitate God. The devil also brings division. He attacks us right where we are. You know, look at social media. You can't get on social media and have a discussion without creating all kinds of arguments and strife. Um, this is one of the reasons I like to post my messages on social media because, you know, you kind of, you can't help but see this as a tool the devil uses. I want to make sure and use it for God's glory, for God's good. Um, the devil likes to <clears throat> cause division in race and politics and belief, even denominations within the church. Uh, so, <clears throat> we need to make sure we continue to be the salt and the light that Jesus created us to be and shine his light into the darkness. How do you open your heart to Christ? In Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14, <clears throat> It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. <clears throat> think, about, think about the heart being a house with many rooms. You know, if you invite Jesus into your life, he first met you in the living room, probably, the, the, the place of daily activity, giving God the living room of your heart. Okay? But then as you go through every other room of the heart, Jesus slowly taking over every aspect of your life. 
Jesus will say, wait a minute, uh, something still smells bad in this house. And a lot of us have this this one little room locked up, right? Where we're like, oh, we don't want you in there, Jesus. Don't come in there. This locked closet upstairs no one knew about. Certainly not wanting God to see, right? But the Lord says, I need to have that closet. I need to have that locked space. So we need to hand over the key to Jesus. Let him open the door. And sure enough, there's all those secrets and sinful habits in that closet, right? You know what I'm talking about? The Lord can cleanse that, take all that out, and say, now I can be at home with you. Look at your life. What rooms do you have Jesus locked out of? Is it your bedroom, your personal life? Is it your game room, those things you enjoy that aren't pleasing to him? Or do you have that secret closet you're trying to hide? Whatever it is, open the doors of your heart and let Jesus come in and dwell with you there. Stop trying to keep Christ out of certain areas of your life. You know, enduring satisfaction comes only from God. As you read in Ecclesiastes 2, you read about King Solomon. Um, he's considered the author of Ecclesiastes. The uh, Bible says he was the wisest man who ever lived in 1 Kings 3.12. He had wealth beyond imagination, probably puts Bill Gates and some of these other wealthy people to shame. He was blessed with the privilege of building God's temple. So we might expect that he would have been content, right? As he was searching for fulfillment, Solomon explored all kinds of things. He, he indulged in the pleasures of the world, even dabbling in pursuits that he knew was folly. But the satisfaction Solomon was seeking evaded him, so he tried other areas. He did great projects like building houses, gardens, parks. He had this really elaborate irrigation project, Ecclesiastes 2, verses 4 and 6. But in the end, he concluded it was all without meaning. Hmm, sounds familiar, right? Our culture today pursues pleasure and does not accept limits on its passions. Solomon had the wisdom and the resources to accomplish whatever he chose to do. Yet the goals he pursued brought no lasting satisfaction. Long before the Rolling Stones, Solomon can't get no satisfaction. He concluded that the best course was to obey God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The best course is to obey God. You know, true enjoyment comes when we Align ourselves with God's will. Any other way is meaningless. Meaningless. We need to focus on things above. John eleven forty four. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. You know, symbolically, Lazarus is like a lot of Christians. You know, the Bible talks of us passing from death into a new life when we're born again, but it's also true in the physical and emotional realm that we bring our grave clothes from our old life with us, you know, those habits, those attitudes, and we need to be loosed to fully enjoy our new life. You know, our emotions and our attitudes follow what we think. When we focus our attention on our problems, then our problems are magnified, right? When we neglect our problems and we think on God's provision, then the answer is magnified and the problem kind of shrinks away, right? It's all about what you think upon. Whatever we think upon is what's going to dominate us. If we think on depressing things, we'll be depressed. Funny how that works. If you think on uplifting things, we'll be uplifted. If you think by his stripes we are healed, then you'll be healed. If you think on sickness, then you'll be sick. The mind's a very powerful thing. Godly contentment isn't dependent upon our circumstances. That's totally opposite of the way most people think today. No one really desires depression, but very few find any real responsibility or authority to maintain positive emotions in the face of negative circumstances. They think emotions follow circumstances. That's not true. Emotions follow the way we think, and we can choose to think on things that are lovely that are true, that are of good report, and so on, regardless of our circumstances. So 
as we think is how we respond emotionally. So focus your attention on the invisible truths of the spiritual realm that are eternal instead of on the visible things of this physical world that will pass away. Focus on things above, not on things here on the earth. And watch how things change in your life. Focus on Christ. Keep your focus on Him. Trust Him to bring you through all things. And watch how your life will change. I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Please go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday.